This is lesson 23 in our Calculus 3 series, Double Integrals and Polar Coordinates. Let's start by recalling what we know about polar coordinates. We know that in the two-dimensional plane we can identify our point either in its x and y coordinates, those are our Cartesian coordinates, x being the distance over and y being the distance up, or we can identify the same point using our theta coordinates, where we draw a segment from that point to the origin R is the length of that segment, the distance from the point to the origin, and theta is the angle that segment makes with the positive x-axis. And we know the relationship between the two sets of coordinates are x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and x squared plus y squared equals r squared. When we talk about functions in polar coordinates, we're talking about r is a function of theta, and we've seen functions like these before, r is equal to 1 plus sine theta, and r is equal to 2 cosine 4 theta, for example. Now imagine we're integrating to find a volume over a domain like one of these. We would want to use polar coordinates to describe the domain, and so we'd want the entire double integral in polar coordinates. So as we develop the idea of double integrals and polar coordinates, we need to think about what a polar rectangle would look like and how to break up a domain in polar coordinates. Let's take a look here at this region described by the set of points r theta such that r is between a and b, theta is between alpha and beta. So in polar coordinates, what does that mean? It means we're starting at radius of a, this is the circle of radius a, and going to r equals b, circle of radius b. But we only want the part of this region that is between theta equals alpha, that's the theta equals alpha ray, and theta equals beta. So what we're saying here is that this angle is equal to alpha, and this larger angle here is equal to beta. So this is what we call a polar rectangle. It has constant bounds on both r and theta. And if we're going to break up this region so that we can take Riemann sums for volume, we need to think about what the subdivisions would look like and what the subrectangles would look like. So breaking up our interval on r into m parts, we have r0, r1, this would be ri minus 1, ri, and rm. Breaking up our theta interval from theta 0 to theta n, here we would have theta j minus 1 and theta j, for example, so that this polar rectangle would be rij, and that would be one of the subrectangles used in our Riemann sum. And what we would need is to find the area of this polar subrectangle. So we want to think about taking the area of this thin circular sector and from it subtracting the area of the smaller thin circular sector. So let's take a look at that. We recall that the area of a circle, a is equal to pi r squared, and notice this is for when theta is equal to 2 pi. That gives us the area of the whole circle. We want to scale this area for angle theta. So that means we want to multiply this by theta over 2 pi. The pi's will cancel, and we'll get theta over 2 r squared. So the area of this sector of circle of radius r is going to be theta over 2 r squared. Now for the area of rij, we want to subtract two of those circular sector areas. And notice that r goes from ri minus 1 to ri for capital rij. So the larger sector area has radius ri and looks like delta theta j over 2 times ri squared. And then the smaller sector area has r i minus 1 as a radius, so we've got delta theta j over 2 r i minus 1 squared, and so factoring we can write it this way. And then notice r i minus r i minus 1 is equal to delta r i, so we're going to factor here the difference of two squares so that we can write this factor as delta r i. Remember that this area is being used in a Riemann sum 
So we want to get this in a notation that's going to be convenient and useful for our Riemann sums. So we want to have the delta ri and the delta theta j. And now this ri plus ri minus 1 over 2, notice that's the average radius here. That's the average between ri and ri minus 1. That's this radius here. So we're going to call that ri star. And then our Riemann sums from lesson 21 in polar coordinates look like this. We've got the limit as a maximum of delta ri and delta theta j go to zero. So we want the dimensions of those polar rectangles to be going to zero. Now for the function evaluation f of x, y, we know that x is equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta, and that f of x, y is going to give us our z value. That's going to be the height when we're taking these volumes in the Riemann sum. So that xij star, yij star, that was our evaluation point in the Cartesian rectangle, and we need a similar evaluation point in our polar rectangle. So we're going to have ri star, the same ri star we have up here, and theta j star, which we can take to be any theta value in the subrectangle. So that we're evaluating f at a point in here, and as delta ri and delta theta j go to zero, in the limit, we're getting f of r cosine theta, r sine theta. And notice the area element that we had here becomes r dr d theta in the limit. So notice that extra copy of r that we get that comes from the polar area. And we have our bounds on r, a and b, and our bounds on theta, alpha, and beta. And so with this definition of a double integral and polar coordinates, we can change our integrals from Cartesian to polar coordinates if that's more convenient to solve. So let's take a look at an example. Find the double integral of f of x, y is equal to x squared plus y over the top half of the unit disk. So here's our function that goes inside the integral. And the top half of the unit disk in Cartesian coordinates gets described as y going from 0 to radical 1 minus x squared, right? That's y equals 0, and y equals radical 1 minus x squared. And then with that, x goes from negative 1 to 1. Now what happens when we go to integrate here with respect to y? We're going to have x squared y, and we're going to have to plug this in. So we're going to have to take the integral then with respect to x of x squared times radical 1 minus x squared. And by switching the order of integration, you'd get something similar. So we want to take a look at this in polar coordinates. In polar coordinates, we can easily describe our domain as r going from 0 to 1 and theta going from 0 to pi. And then our x squared becomes r cosine theta quantity square, y becomes r sine theta, and the area element dy dx becomes r dr d theta. So distributing the r, we're here, and integrating, we get r to the fourth over four cosine square theta plus r to the third over three sine theta. Now we want to plug in our bounds and subtract. And so we're here. And then we make an easy substitution for cosine square theta is 1 half 1 plus cosine 2 theta. Then integrating with respect to theta, plugging in our bounds, we're here. Pi over 8 plus 2 thirds. Now let's take a look at another example. We want to integrate x squared plus y squared over this domain d. So it's the region between the circle of radius 1 and the circle of radius 4. Now if we wanted to do this in Cartesian coordinates, we'd have to split up this domain into type 1 and type 2 regions. It's much easier, however, to describe this domain in terms of polar coordinates. And because x squared plus y squared is so simple in terms of polar coordinates as well, the whole problem is going to be simplified. So writing this integral in polar coordinates looks like the integral of r squared times r dr d theta. We've got r going from 1 to 4. And we've got theta going from 0 to 2 pi. Theta goes from 0 all the way around to 2 pi. 
So we integrate, we get r to the fourth over four, plug in our bounds, integrate with respect to theta, and we've got 255 pi over two. Let's take a look at another example. And notice for this example that if we integrate the function f of x, y equals one, or z equals one, over domain d, then the value we're going to get in cubic units represents a volume, but because the height of that surface is, is only one, the value is actually the same as the area would be in square units. Again, because that height is equal to one, it's a constant height of one, the volume we're getting has the same value as the area of the domain. Of course, volume would be measured in cubic units and area would be in square units, but that number is gonna be the same. So if we wanna find the area, for example, of one leaf of this lemnus gate, then we could find the volume under the surface f of x, y equals one, which is what we have here. So let's take a look at how we're gonna do that. Find the area of one leaf of the lemnus gate. So we definitely want to take our double integral of the function one, but we need to think about then what the bounds are on r and theta so that we can describe our domain here in polar coordinates. So notice the r square we have here. r square is equal to four cosine two theta. This relationship only exists when four cosine two theta is greater than or equal to zero because r square is always greater than or equal to zero. So that tells us that this graph only exists for certain theta values. We know that cosine of an angle is going to be greater than or equal to zero when that angle is between negative pi over two and pi over two, between three pi over two and five pi over two, etc. Since the angle we have here is two theta and we're solving for theta, we need to divide that by two. And so we want to figure out which interval or intervals on theta we'll need to describe one leaf of the lemnus gate here. Now if theta goes from negative pi over four to pi over four, that's negative pi over four to pi over four, and we take the positive r values, we're gonna get this part of the curve. But for the same theta values, we can also take the negative r values, and we'll get the other part of the curve. So we notice that negative pi over four to pi over four defines the whole graph for both of these branches of r. We only want one leaf, so why don't we simplify things by taking r to be positive radical of four cosine two theta over this interval. And so r goes from zero to radical four cosine two theta, and theta goes from negative pi over four to pi over four. Now by the symmetry in this graph, you might be interested in instead taking theta from zero to pi over four and multiplying by two. You can certainly do that here if you like. So now integrating, we're here, r squared over two, plugging in our bounds, and now we want to integrate on theta. So our cosine two theta becomes a one half sine two theta. Our twos cancel, the four stays. Plugging in our pi over four and zero, we get two times one or two. And so in square units, that's the area of one leaf of that graph. In cubic units, it would give you the volume under the surface z equals one and over one leaf of the graph. Now, remember that we already had a way to find the same area from calc two. What did that look like in calc two? In calc two, our area integral was one half integral from alpha to beta of f of theta squared d theta, where r is equal to f of theta. So in this case, we're using the positive branch of r. So we've got radical four cosine two theta. That's our f of theta. So we're squaring it here. We lose the radical. Alpha and beta start out negative pi over four to pi over four. Again, you could use symmetry if you like and multiply the integral by two. And this notice, is the same integral that we had here. And so we get the same answer. 
Now let's take a look at this example. Find the volume of the solid between z equals 16 minus x squared minus y squared and z equals 3x squared plus 3y squared. So z equals 16 minus x squared minus y squared is this red surface on top. It's a downward facing paraboloid shifted up 16 units. And then z equals 3x squared plus 3y squared is this surface on the bottom. It's a paraboloid. So we want the volume of the solid between these two surfaces. And we notice by looking at this picture that the curve of intersection is going to help us describe the domain that we're over. So let's find that curve of intersection by setting these two z values equal to each other. So we're getting 4 equals x squared plus y squared. So that's our circle of radius 2 in the xy plane. And I'm drawing it in the xy plane because notice that this circle encloses the domain for both of these surfaces. So we want to integrate the top surface minus the bottom surface over this domain. Okay, it doesn't look like a polar coordinates problem yet, right? Let's set it up in Cartesian and see what it looks like. We want to integrate the top surface minus the bottom surface over our domain D. So we're here. And then describing our domain D in Cartesian coordinates says that y is going from negative radical 4 minus x squared to positive radical 4 minus x squared. while x goes from negative 2 to 2. Now similar to the example we saw at the start of the video, this isn't going to be easy in Cartesian coordinates. So let's take a look at switching this to polar coordinates. Now why are we even thinking of polar coordinates? Because our domain D is a disk. It's a disk of radius 2. So we know that our domain at least is going to be simple in polar coordinates. We're not sure yet that transferring this function to polar coordinates is going to be a reasonable integral, but let's give it a shot and see if it is. In this case, because we've got a negative 4x squared minus 4y squared, that's just going to change to negative 4r squared, and it is quite simple in polar coordinates as well. And our domain in polar coordinates has r going from 0 to 2, and theta going from 0 to 2 pi. That gives us that disk of radius 2. So we distribute our r and integrate plug in our bounds, and integrate with respect to theta, and we've got 32 pi. So in this case, what didn't look like a polar coordinates problem at all became much easier to solve using polar coordinates. So keep that in mind as one of your tools as we continue to find volumes and solve double integrals. And this will conclude our lesson on double integrals and polar coordinates.